Good day everyone, this is Dr. Soper here, and today I'll be discussing the foundations of Q learning, which is a type of reinforcement learning within the broader domain of artificial intelligence. If you're unfamiliar with reinforcement learning, then I would recommend that you watch the earlier video in this series entitled Foundations of Reinforcement Learning before watching this video. Before we begin discussing the foundations of Q learning, let's briefly review what you'll learn in this lesson. By the time you have finished this lesson, you will know what Q learning is, characteristics of Q learning models, what Q values are, what temporal differences are, what the Bellman equation is, and how the Q learning process works. Once we understand all of these concepts, we'll be fully equipped to start building some AI models that rely on Q learning. So why wait? Let's get started. To begin, let's talk briefly about what Q learning is. As noted a few moments ago, Q learning is a type of reinforcement learning. Just like other forms of reinforcement learning, this means that Q learning based systems involve an AI agent that is operating in an environment with states and rewards, that is inputs, and actions, that is output. Unlike some other forms of reinforcement learning, however, Q learning is focused on what are known as model free environments. In a model-free environment, the AI agent is not seeking to learn about an underlying mathematical model or probability distribution, as was the case with our recent videos about Thompson sampling-based reinforcement learning. Instead, in Q-learning, the AI agent attempts to construct an optimal policy directly by interacting with the environment. The AI agent does this by adopting an explicit trial-and-error-based technique in which the agent learns by repeatedly attempting to solve the problem using varied approaches across many different episodes while continuously updating its policy with what it has learned. Now that we have a basic understanding of what Q-learning is, let's briefly discuss the characteristics of Q-learning models. First, since Q-learning is a type of reinforcement learning, all of the fundamental characteristics of reinforcement learning models also apply to Q-learning models. Thus, Q-learning models have an input and an output system, rewards, an environment, they operate on the basis of a Markov decision process, and they have a training mode and an inference mode. In addition to these five fundamental characteristics of all reinforcement learning models, Q-learning models also include two additional characteristics. First, the number of possible states in Q-learning models is finite. The AI agent will therefore always be in one of a fixed number of possible situations. Second, the number of possible actions in Q-learning models is also finite. The AI agent will therefore always need to choose what to do next from among a fixed number of possible actions. With all of these characteristics in mind, let's take a look at a few classic Q-learning problems, beginning with a maze. In a maze, we can think of each possible location as a state. The AI agent may find itself in any possible location, and hence may begin in any state. The goal, of course, is to reach the exit as quickly as possible. To do this, the AI must move in one of four directions, up, right, down, or left. And these four movements represent the possible actions that the AI agent can take. A second classic Q-learning example is the cliff walking problem. In this scenario, the AI agent may again find itself at any possible location within the environment, and again, the available locations represent the set of possible states. As with the maze, the AI agent's possible actions are to move up, right, down, or left. The goal is to reach a particular location safely without falling down the cliff, which is represented by one or more locations in the environment. The AI agent, then, must learn to reach the target location without falling down the cliff, despite the fact that the agent does not know which location is the target location. In both of these scenarios, and indeed in all Q-learning scenarios, the AI agent learns about the environment by relying on and updating Q-values. So what are Q-values then? Well, a Q-value indicates the quality of a particular action, A, in a given state s, which we can represent as a function q with two input parameters s and a. Since the q stands for quality, 
we can already begin to infer that the AI agent is interested in identifying the highest quality action in any given state. A bit more formally, Q values are our current estimates of the sum of future rewards if we were to take a particular action at this moment in time. That is, Q values estimate how much additional reward we can expect to accumulate through all remaining steps in the current episode if the AI agent is currently in state S and decides to take action A. Q values therefore increase as the AI agent gets closer and closer to the highest reward. It is important at this point to reiterate from an earlier lesson that in reinforcement learning, rewards can be positive or negative. If you like, you may conceptualize negative rewards as punishments, and indeed, many Q learning problems use negative rewards. In these scenarios, the goal of the AI agent is still to maximize its total rewards, but with negative rewards, we can think of this goal as the agent trying to minimize its total punishments. Just as with humans and other animals, then, AI agents can learn through both positive and negative reinforcement. Next, let's learn about Q tables. In Q learning, Q values are stored in a Q table, which has one row for each possible state and one column for each possible action. For example, consider this very simple cliff walking environment. As you can see, each location or state in the environment is identified by the combination of a row index and a column index. In this example, the upper left state thus has a location of 0, 0, while the lower right state has a location of 2, 3. Now let's see how all of the Q values for this cliff walking problem can be represented in a Q table. As you can see, the Q table has one row for each possible state and one column for each possible action. Remember, the Q values themselves represent our current estimates of the sum of all future rewards if we were to take a particular action in a particular state at this moment in time. You may have noticed that, in this example, all of the non-cliff Q values are negative, except for the target location, which has the highest possible Q values of zero. This clearly indicates that a negative reward structure is being used, and that the AI agent will be trying to minimize its total punishments. Returning to the Q table, Note that an optimal queue table will contain values that allow the AI agent to take the best action in any possible state, thus providing the agent with the optimal path to the highest reward. The queue table therefore represents the AI agent's policy for acting in the current environment. Next, let's talk about temporal differences. In queue learning, temporal differences, or TDs, provide us with a method of calculating how much the Q value for the action taken in the previous state should be changed based on what the AI agent has learned about the Q values for the current state's actions. This means that in the Q learning process, we will always update the Q value for the most recent action with what we have learned about our new state. Thus, if the new state is promising, that is, if it provides us with a relatively good reward, then the Q value for the previous action will be increased. The AI agent will then be able to rely on this knowledge to help it make decisions during the next training episode. I know that this equation for calculating temporal differences seems intimidating, but it's really not. Let's take a closer look. To begin, note that we are calculating the temporal difference for the action taken in the previous state. Our AI agent will be able to benefit from this information whenever it finds itself in that state again in the future. Next, note that the temporal difference includes the reward that was received for the action that was taken in the previous state. Importantly, this is referring to the immediate reward. This is very different from the Q values, which represent our current estimates of the sum of all future rewards if we were to take a particular action in a particular state. Returning to our recent cliff walking example, we know the Q values might look something like this, while the immediate rewards might look something like this. Note that the AI agent receives a severe punishment if it falls down the cliff, while it receives only a very mild punishment, that is, a negative reward, if it moves to any other location that is not the target location. Returning to our temporal difference formula, 
The next variable in the equation is a discount factor called gamma. This variable can have any value in the range of 0 to 1, but it is typically assigned a value somewhat close to 1, such as 0 0.9. The purpose of this gamma variable is to provide a mechanism for discounting future rewards. This intuitively makes sense if you consider that the value of receiving a particular reward in the future is generally less than the value of receiving the same reward today. For example, if I told you that I could give you $100 today, or $100 a year from now, which would you choose? This is the purpose of the discount factor. The next element of our equation is simply the maximum Q value that is currently available for any action in our current state. Let's take a moment to think about what this means. Recall that we're calculating this temporal difference value in order to figure out by how much we should adjust the Q value for the previous action. Recall also that the Q values for the current state represent our best estimate of the sum of all future rewards for each possible action that we might take in the current state. What we're really trying to do in the big picture, then, is update the Q value for the previous action based on the idea that the maximum future reward for that action is the sum of the immediate reward for taking that action and the maximum future reward that is available for taking an action in the next state. Finally, we subtract the Q value for the AI agent's most recent action, yielding the temporal difference value for the most recent action. Now let's see how these temporal difference values are used. The last equation that we'll look at is called the Bellman equation which is easily the most famous equation in all of reinforcement learning. The reason that the Bellman equation is so important is that it tells us exactly what new value to use as the Q value for the action taken in the previous state. The Bellman equation relies on both the old Q value for the action taken in the previous state, as well as what the AI agent has learned after moving to the next state. The Bellman equation also includes a learning rate parameter, alpha, that defines how quickly Q values are adjusted. This means that we have a mechanism for controlling how quickly the AI agent learns. As the name suggests, the Bellman equation was invented by Richard Bellman, an award-winning applied mathematician. Let's take a look at the Bellman equation itself. As you can see, the equation is quite straightforward. It simply specifies that the new Q value for the most recently taken action is the sum of the previous Q value for that action, and the product of the learning rate parameter, alpha, and the temporal difference value that we calculated a few moments ago. Note that the learning rate can be any value in the range from 0 to 1, and that this learning rate parameter can be adjusted during the training process as needed. Taken together, we can therefore use the temporal difference formula and the Bellman equation to easily calculate the new Q value for the action that was most recently taken by the AI agent. Now that we're familiar with all of the basic elements of Q-learning, let's look at the process as a whole. As you can see, the process begins by initializing the Q-table. Remember that the Q-table represents the AI agent's policy for how to behave in the environment. Any values can be used to initialize the Q-table. For example, recalling our simple cliff-walking scenario, we might choose to use zeros for all of the initial Q values, as shown here. Next, we choose an action from the Q table for the current state. Ordinarily, our AI agent might choose the action with the highest Q value, but it's also important to have a mechanism that will encourage the agent to explore its environment. A very common strategy for this is to use what's called an epsilon greedy algorithm. In the epsilon greedy algorithm, the AI agent will usually choose the action with the highest Q value, say 90% of the time, but will choose an action at random for the remaining 10% of the time. This means that the AI agent will occasionally explore what seems to be a less promising path in the short term, with the hope that it may lead to the discovery of a better overall path in the long term. As with the discussion in our previous lessons on reinforcement learning, this is yet another fine example of handling the exploration-exploitation dilemma. After the AI agent has chosen which action to take, we then take that action and transition to the next state. We then receive our reward for taking the most recent action, 
and we use that reward in conjunction with the knowledge that we've learned about our new state to compute the temporal difference value for our previous action. Finally, we use the temporal difference value and the Bellman equation to update the Q value for our most recent action. We then loop back to the beginning by once again choosing an action for the current state. The process continues until we reach a terminal state, such as the target location or falling down the cliff. After reaching a terminal state, we move the AI agent back to an initial state and start a new episode in which it tries to solve the problem again by using the updated Q values from the previous episode. The agent will often run through 1,000 or more episodes before we are satisfied that it has learned the optimal policy for the environment. Finally, once the Q learning model is fully trained, it can be used for inference. In a practical sense, this means that the AI agent can use the policy to make decisions in real-world situations. Once the model is running in inference mode, Q values are no longer updated, and for any state, the action that the AI agent chooses to take will simply be the action with the largest Q value. Now that we have a good understanding of the principles of Q learning, we can begin to create artificial intelligence models that use Q learning to solve real business problems. In the next video in this series, we'll see how Q learning based AI can be used to solve a warehouse robot routing problem. We will definitely be getting a lot of practical hands on experience in creating an AI model in Python in the next video, so I hope you'll join me as we continue our adventures in cognitive computing and artificial intelligence. Well, my friends, thus ends our lesson on the foundations of Q learning. I hope that you learned something interesting in this lesson, and until next time, have a great day.